Olá, muito boa noite. É um prazer ter a sua companhia para o arranque de mais uma edição do programa Impertinente da Fundação Francisco Manuel dos Santos, dedicado a entrevistas com grandes personalidades internacionais ligadas à economia, sociedade e política. Hoje, a nossa convidada especial é uma das psicólogas sociais mais conceituadas do planeta. Professora na Universidade de Princeton, nos Estados Unidos, e autora, Susan Fisk é conhecida pelo seu trabalho sobre cognição social, estereótipos e preconceito. Numa altura em que a nossa sociedade a sociedade está mais polarizada e segmentada que sempre, tanto online como offline, tenho a certeza que vamos ter conteúdo suficiente para a nossa conversa. Hello Susan, thank you for making time. It's a pleasure to see you. Before we get stuck into uh, the details of what our conversation will be about today regarding stereotypes and, and, and prejudice, let me ask you for as an expert, what is your definition? for a stereotype? Uh, it's a shortcut that we use to make sense of other people. What motivates my work is that human beings are such complicated stimuli, and it's amazing to me that we form impressions of each other so quickly. And stereotypes are one way we do that. That, that was actually more concise than I, than I thought it was going to be, and it, but it's very clear. And my follow-up then is, what do you think is the stereotype that is most ingrained in, in people's brains? Well, am I allowed to have a three-way tie? Um, <laughs> I would say gender, age, and um, some form of ranking, either race or social class. So people automatically, within seconds of seeing each other, judge another person's gender and rough age and rank and you can't help it it's automatic how long does that process take seconds less you could you could do a subliminal flash of a person's face and people can tell you what gender they think the person is and older than me younger than me um, and oftentimes rank as well Wow, all right, let's start with man versus woman then. Um, because, because I think that, that, that that's, that's the, first, the first port of call. Um, talk to me about how you have seen the dynamic and the image of men and women change during your lifetime from a personal standpoint, but a professional standpoint as well. Well, it's been one of the more dramatic changes, uh, so The old fashioned stereotypes were that men were strong and full of agency and assertiveness and women uh, were nice and moral and um, could be counted on to be trustworthy. And what's happened is, and this comes from observing the social roles that men and women fill traditionally. So men most places are the breadwinners and women most places are the ones who stay home with children. And so agency and strength is required for men to be breadwinners and um, warmth and uh, trustworthiness is required of women to be effective caregivers. But what's happened is that as women are working, women have acquired more stereotypic competence. So people think that women are both warm and trustworthy and competent on the other hand. Whereas men, interestingly, um, have just stayed competent but haven't gotten warmer. So I would suggest that it might be good for men to think about uh, working on the warm part of uh, this, their roles because they can only gain from that. I, I do want to ask you about women in leadership positions in, in, in just a little bit because we have seen in some countries and some regions women rise to the positions of, of prime ministers and, and, and leaders of of government, but before, before I do that, um, I think it must be tremendously difficult for women to be able to balance being respected professionally while staying feminine, and if traditionally men are in a position of power, how they portray themselves in order to be in the, in the workplace judged only for their professionalism and not for being a woman or attractive or not attractive or Uh, finding that balance. Uh, tell, me, tell me how you've seen the navigation of all of those dynamics. Well, look, there are constraints on both men and women. So, you know, 
contrary to what people normally think of, men get harassed at work also. So particularly um, in the trades uh, or in dangerous professions, men can be harassed for not being man enough. And if there's a guy on the crew who's not man enough, the other guys will harass him to try to make him more manly. Um, but the, the dilemma for women is um, more of a tightrope between being competent enough to be respected, but not being um, too masculine. So the way I like to think about it is that there's sort of two things going on and they're not, they're not trade-offs. It's not one, high on one, low on the other. It's you can be high or low on competence and you can be high or low on trustworthiness. And so women, it's a great position to be in because women get to do both. I'll be honest with you. I, I, um, I started working in the States in the late 90s, and I had come from a, a job here in Portugal, working in the media. And for me, it was, it was incredible, the different dynamic that there was in the States regarding uh, uh, the approach that people had professionally for women that they had in Portugal at that time. Um, it, it's very much a, a patriarch kind of professional structure here. Whereas in the States, I noticed they were uh, light years ahead in the way that they, that they treated women. Uh, I still notice a big difference in that today, to, to, to be honest with you. But what does that roadmap look like for women to be able to, 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 to make that, that leap into a more uh, uh, equal working environment? Well, I can tell you that it, it's a dilemma that goes back generations in my own family. So. My great grandmother, um, you know, was a leader in the women's fight for, for votes. She was a women's suffragist, um, but not very attentive to her family and the same, the next generation. And then my mother chose not to work, but instead to be a good mother. And then I figured I, my job was to be, try to be both. So, it, you know, it has traditionally been a, an either or choice, but I think there are more and more chances to do both well and so i think it's a fantastic time to be a female person who wants to work um, because you can you can do both and um, it's not either or uh, i think but i think it's harder for men because men have not figured out a way to um work on their sort of so so to speak softer side but once uh, once people think that you know, being a true man is a guy who can be good with the baby as well as good at work. I think everybody will be happier. So what advice would you have for a man who, let's call them, is more old school in trying to adapt? Uh, and let's say he's leading a team that's a mix of men and women. How does he, how can he connect with, with, with women on a professional level while maintaining the respect of the manly audience, let's say, in his team? So I would say, with, with regard to all in-group, out-group um, interactions, it's never wrong to respect people. I mean, bottom line, that's it. Show respect. Um, so particularly if you're relating to somebody who's lower in the hierarchy than you, trying to be overly familiar and being pals with them is really not what they want. They want to be respected. And so if a guy is running a team and men are, traditionally have higher status than women, rather than chatting with her about her home life or how she looks or something that seems friendly, but isn't necessarily because it's sort of patronizing, um, I would advise, you know, treat her with respect for her work and her abilities and what she's bringing to the team. Let's um, have a look at other areas um, of, of discrimination and stereotyping. Um, you mentioned uh, race, and I'd also like to go into social class a little bit because um, I feel the Portuguese culture is still very much uh, um, organized in that way, and I'll, I'll ask you for your insight on, on the study you've, you, you've done of our, of our society, but um, 
Would it be fair to say that, that we are in a very polarized world now, especially in, in a digital sense, in a social media way, politically, economically? Um, what does that mean for different races and, and, and classes globally in the way that they want to be able to, to, to transcend that, that or, or be in the middle of that polarization and be respected uh, uh, overall? Wow, well, you, <laughs> you brought up a lot of different kinds of biases there. Um, let me say something about political biases and then move to social class. Okay. Which they're related, but they're not the same. So the political biases, I think, have to do with um, whether you're more in favor of um, tradition and keeping things safe and the same, or whether you're more in favor of um, exploring new things and, and progress. And that's a fundamental ideological difference that happens over and over again, not just in politics, but also uh, people who are religious versus not religious, or people who want adventure or not adventure, or people who want to travel or, or stay home. So that's a fundamental human difference. We call it the explore-exploit difference. And I think those kinds of ideological tastes will always be with us in one form or another. The, the issue with politics is that um, social media use and um, news media use has divided people so that people get different information. Um, and so it just exa exasperates, exa exaggerates the difference. And uh, it makes it harder to overcome. People have to meet each other face to face in order to overcome these things. And we don't do that. You know, we stay away from people whose politics is opposite to ours. So we can say something a little later about how to fix these things. But, but you know, this political divide actually goes way back to people who are more, um, you know, in favor of exploring new things and people who are more in favor of exploiting what they have in the moment. But what, you mentioned social class. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I also wanted to get into that. Yeah, so the United States is a funny place about social class. People pretend that social class doesn't matter and that anybody can be anything. And it's a nice ideal, but it's not true. So the United States does not have very good social class mobility, contrary to the American ideal, the American dream. Uh, so when I first wanted to study social class, I couldn't find any students who wanted to do it with me. They said, oh, we're all middle class. You know, we, we don't have social status in the United States. Well, that's not true. We do. We have it like everybody else does. Every society on the planet has uh, divisions by social class. And, uh, and people talk up to people who are more important than they are um, differently than they talk down. So um, actually I gave that to, as the title to a book that I wrote, you know, Envy Up, Scorn Down. And, you know, it's because the status system is so universal and you can understand so many things that way. So it, the people on the top, everybody assumes that they're competent, but they don't assume that they're nice. And so if they want to get along with other people, they often try to be super nice and to downplay their confidence when they're talking below them. Like if an if a executive is talking to a secretary, you know, he might be all, he, stereotypically, might be all warm and friendly. But as I said earlier, what he really should be doing is respecting her. Mm. You know, she's dealing with him and other crazy bureaucrats and functionaries, and she's managing all this. And... What she, what she wants is in the conversation to be competent. So you've got two people talking to each other who are missing each other. One's trying to be warm and friendly and the other one's trying to be competent. And uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding across statuses. And it's, it's true across social class too. You know, if you're a homeowner and you, and you employ a skilled carpenter, you know, rather than trying to be all sort of palsy and folksy, you should be respectful of the person and everything that he can do that you can't do. So now I, I, I will I will tell you something, Susan. Um, I think Portugal is is a country where people are incredibly judged 
for, for social class. By the way that they carry themselves, how they speak, the words they use, the accents they have, the clothes they wear, the haircut they have. It, it's unbelievable, I think, uh, having lived in four countries like I have, uh, mm -hmm. and even people talk a lot about the, 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 the snobby English people or the snobby uh, uh, toffs in the UK, but for me, I have never seen something as segmented as that as I have in, in, in Portugal from a judgmental uh, standpoint. And when I got to the States, I did notice that it's not such a big thing. I'm not saying it doesn't exist like you said it did, but it's not such a big thing. How, how can a society outgrow the, 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 those prejudices? Because uh, uh, here in Portugal, it's, I, I think it's, it's incredible. I will actually say it's incredible. Well, I think if anything helps us get over in the U.S., get over, you know, social class. I mean, for one thing, people move around a lot. Yeah. So their accents change. And um, you can tell a little bit by somebody's accent, certainly by their vocabulary, you know, how much education they have and what their status is. Um, but I know it's not like, say, the U.K., I don't speak Portuguese, but I can tell, you know, in the UK. But, yeah. um, but you know, the, I mean, the ideal in all the different countries we've studied is the middle class. Everybody thinks those are competent, warm, trustworthy people. Okay. And everybody thinks that rich people are, okay, they might be competent because they earned it or because they were educated well, but they're not nice. Um, so, there, so even though people might make social class distinctions and judge each other, the rich don't come out very well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I teach at Princeton, which is a sort of by reputation an upper crust school. Where, you know, we're admitting quite a few, like 60% of the Princeton kids have scholarships now. So it's not the same as it used to be. But the Ivy League schools have a reputation for being, you know, high status. And so... If I meet somebody on an airplane and I want to I want to talk to them, I don't mm. say I work at Princeton right mm. away. So if they say what you know where do you live, I say oh I live outside New York. If I say I live in New Jersey, they feel sorry for me. So that's not good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, my sister lives in New Jersey, so I know <laughs> I know what yeah. you mean. <laughs> so and if I say I live in Princeton, then they stop talking to me. So it depends on <laughs> whether I want to talk to them or not. <laughs> um, I, I did want to pick up on the, on the Portugal link, see what kind of picture you could paint of our society regarding stereotypes and, and, and prejudice here. Well, so a number of years ago, we did, and, and ongoing, we've been doing studies all over the world of the maps of the stereotypes in different countries. And all over, you know, we have 50 different countries, including Portugal, where we have samples. And so, you know, Many stereotypes in Portugal are quite similar to other places. So middle class are held up as the ideal, but also Catholics and white people in, in general. Um, rich people are seen as, as I said, you know, okay, they're competent, but they're not nice. Um, old people are nice, but incompetent. So that's a kind of patronizing pity. Mm. And then... The worst kind of situation are um, Roma people and homeless people, anybody without an address, really super poor people. And that's true everywhere. So in that way, Portugal is similar to other countries we've studied. Um, you know, some of the um, more distinctive stereotypes in Portugal would be the Roma, for example, because in the United States, in many places, there are no Roma people, um, but there are comparable people who are, you know, nomads. So one one th one thing that's really curious to me is why everywhere we've everywhere all over the world, including in Portugal, why is it that not having a fixed address makes you a bad person? Mm -hmm. Hmm. No, that's interesting to to hear you uh, 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 give that 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 picture of of Portugal and the different areas of of, of stereotype. Um, how, how, can we, how can we become more tolerant, Susan? Well, I think there's two ways that we can. Um, one is just being around people. So, you know, if you have a new group of immigrants move to your country and 
you know, they wear funny clothes and they speak their language with a funny accent, or maybe they don't speak it at all. And at first, the natural reaction is to feel, who are these people? You know, are they dangerous? Are they on my side or not? Are they, are they good for the country? Um, but if you, you know, ride the subway every day and you see these people and nothing bad happens, over a period of half a dozen years, you get used to them. And we have data and other people have data from all over the world where when new people arrive someplace, the first reaction is discomfort and people are unhappy about it. But if nothing bad happens and you don't have a demagogue for a leader who exploits the divisions, if, if things are just calm, people get used to the difference. And so I do think that that's one thing that I'm often proud of about the United States is that, mm. you know, we're, we're one of the longest um, immigrant receiving societies on the planet. And on average, we've done pretty well. You know, we have some notable problems and I won't pretend we don't, but when nobody exploits the divisions between people, immigrants do pretty well. And, you know, and every, every American you talk to has a family story about how they came to the United States. You know, obviously people who came in slavery had a different sort of mm. story or people who escaped the Holocaust have a different sort of story. But, but people who, you know, people come under different circumstances and they, it's part of their own family mythology. And so, you know, it, by the third generation, people are considered by themselves and by other people to be Americans. But in the first generation, maybe it's tough. And, and I think you have to give up a lot to immigrate. And so, so we select for people who are open to, open to doing that. Um, so I think my first, so back to your question, my first suggestion is that people need to just give it time and be open to the possibility that these newcomers won't seem so strange to them over time. If, if there's a more sort of, like suppose you're a manager and you have a bunch of people working for you who are coming from different backgrounds and they need to get along, the, the solution there is to um, put them on a team and say, okay, you folks, you have to get this job done together. And I know you're not comfortable with each other, but I don't care. You're gonna get the job done. And when people's livelihood depends on working together, it's amazing how fast they get over their stereotypes. It's interesting to hear you say that because I work very closely with sports and I think that's one of the reasons why people say that, that there isn't the, the kind of, of, of prejudice or discrimination or, or racism that there is in, in other areas of life when, when you're talking about being on a team and having the same objective, right? Yes, yes. And the, in the United States, the single most successful integration uh, institutional integration is the military. Mm. Because if you have an integrated platoon and you're going into a life or death situation, you can't care about the person's background because your life is in their hands. You know, I'm not saying everybody should have a bigger military, but, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's that kind of contingency on somebody else that makes you pay attention to who they really are. Um, to close the interview, I have a, a, a series of, of quick fire questions uh -huh. for you uh, that, that, that you could answer in, in, in a sentence or two if possible. So what exercise concretely could people do to, to become more accepting and to, to change the prejudices we have? Because you say that these judgments are so quick. So uh, uh, how can we untrain those judgments that we have? Uh Think twice. Is, is equality between men and women possible without losing behaviors that we associate anyway of masculinity and femininity and the image of masculinity and femininity? Uh, don't think of them as opposites. Think of them as both things you can do both. So not opposites, but complementary. Uh, not even that, just two different independent things. You can be more or less masculine, you can be more or less feminine, and they're not correlated. 
Um, what is one personality trait a good leader could really benefit to have from? Uh, showing worthy intentions. And I did want to ask you if you thought women can be better leader, better leaders than men because of, of empathy. Well, or there's being data. More warm. Can I answer more than one sentence? Yeah, yeah, this one you can. This one I'll let you. Okay. Um, so, um, on average, women lead in a more participatory way and less autocratic. And when men lead in that way, everybody likes it. So no matter who does it, men or women, um, people like to be led by leaders who consult them and, and are more democratic. But men have a tendency on average to lead in a more autocratic way. So this is an example of where something that on average differs between men and women can be good, good for both men and women when they do it. Interesting. And back to the quick ones, two final ones. What is the biggest challenge do you think that humanity faces today? Um, climate, <laughs> mm. which is not about stereotypes. Mm. But um, except that the haves and the haves nots will suffer differentially from you know climate changing. And if you could change one thing by magic, in today's world, what would it be? Uh, well, first the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. And then the climate. Um, and, I, and again, in, I think in both cases, it helps us to remember that we're all in this together. Susan, it's, it's been really interesting uh, getting your expert opinion on, on uh, on matters that really affect our day-to-day -day interactions with other human beings and the way we see each other, the way we interact with each other, from a gender perspective, an age perspective, a social class perspective, a minority perspective. Um, I wish you all the best, stay safe, and uh, thank, thank you for participating in, in the program. Thanks, you too, take care. Foram as palavras de Susan Fisk, professora na Universidade de Princeton, especialista em Psicologia Social, a falar sobre muitos dos preconceitos que temos na, na, na sociedade moderna, contemporânea, relativamente a, a, ao sexo, às classes sociais, a, a, às minorias na, na, na sociedade também. Uh, gostei muito desta conversa também de falar um bocadinho sobre a diferença entre o que eu notei em Portugal e, 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 e morando fora também, nos Estados Unidos como, como morei, Inglaterra como morei, e ter também a, a perspectiva dela nesse, nesse sentido. Uh, espero que tenha gostado também desta uh, conversa em mais uma edição do programa Impertinente e já sabe, quando há factos, há argumentos. <música>